Okay, good morning. Thanks for being here. My name is Evan Weiner, and I am a journalist by trade. And I've been uh, doing journalist things since 1971, when I was in uh, 11th grade at Spring Valley High School in Rockland County. Uh, we had a uh, high school radio show called Tiger Talk. Had the teacher, Joe Dionisio, English teacher, recently passed away. And I kept in touch with him. And he kind of opened doors for me and he said, student, he always gave you the middle finger when he said, student, uh, you got a great voice. How would you like to be in radio? Yeah, in the worst way. And I was in the worst way. Uh, it was a show called Tiger Talk. It was on WRKL radio. It was a commercial radio station. And I guess that made us a commercial show. Uh, and that's how I started. And he also opened doors for me at the Nyack Journal News along with the Bergen Record, uh, so those two um, um, entities. So I, I cut my teeth in newspapers and in radio. And I start with Journalism 101. And the reason I start with Journalism 101, that's me in front of the Baltimore Sun, roughly 2001, 2002. And I was writing op-ed pieces for the Baltimore Sun, a guy by the name of Richard Gross. And uh, this is August of 2002. And uh, he, Richard calls me, he says, you got anything, thinking about anything? I said, yeah. So said, What's, what are you thinking about? I said, Major League Baseball uh, dispute. Uh, the owners may lock out the players or the players may strike. And uh, whether or not fans have any say in um, what's going on, or are they just an injured third party that uh, has no say? And I said, but they do have say. I said that um, you're not going to get back at the players unless you're not buying baseball cards, but you can get back at the owners. For instance, uh, the owner of the Detroit Tigers, Michael Itlich, owned Little Caesars Restaurant. There were plenty of uh, pizza places to go to, so go somewhere else. Uh, the Atlanta Braves owners at that time, that was Gerald Levin and Time Warner, or yeah, Time Warner, or it was AOL Time Warner, whatever it was, because that was the... Uh, the merger of the century, which went sideways real quick. But don't subscribe to AOL. Use Yahoo. There was no Google on that. I guess there was Google, but it wasn't all that big. Um, don't subscribe to cable TV. Take your money out. You don't need TBS. You don't need CNN. And went down the whole list. Richard said, it's great, great. He said, when can you have it? This is Wednesday. I said, oh, I'm, well, tomorrow. He said, good, I'm going on vacation. So it's an 800-word piece. It's no big deal. I can put it together in 20 minutes. Send it down to him. He looks at it, marks it up, says, hey, we like this. Uh, and he sends it back to me. I said, it looks fine. It's going in Sunday's paper. It's going to be the lead op-ed piece on the Sunday opinion page. Great. I've had that before with the Bergen record. Uh, so he goes on um, Thursday. He's going on vacation. Friday, I get a call from somebody at the Baltimore Sun. We've killed your piece. Why have you killed my piece? Well, we don't advocate boycotts, which you are. I said, oh, that's interesting. Uh, let me ask you a question. He said, yeah. I said, Nelson Mandela, South Africa. A lot of boycotts in South Africa. Any of your op-ed pieces uh, either supporting or opposing the boycotts? Click. Didn't want to answer that. Well, I get another call from an even higher up saying, well, we're not running the piece. I said, uh, well, boycotts, let me ask you a question. Um, I said, I know that you don't support boycotts, and you probably stood on the sidelines with Nelson Mandela in South Africa, which they didn't. Um, who killed this? Well, it turns out, because you probably don't know this, but the Chicago Tribune Company owned the Baltimore Sun. And they were also owners of the Chicago Cubs baseball team. And I didn't put Boycott the Tribune Company, I'm not that stupid, uh, in the piece. Uh, I said, who in Chicago killed this? Well, what do you mean? I said, you didn't kill it locally. I know it was killed in Chicago. Did it go all the way up to the CEO, Dennis Fitzsimons? Oh, I don't know, I don't know. Well, they never gave me an answer. Poor Richard, uh, he was fired soon afterwards and they never used me again because I suggested the boycott and I was censored. Now that piece I put into a book, it's online, if you ever want to read it, it's out there, it's online, but that's censorship. And in this case, censorship because of money. I am saying, hey, look, baseball fans, don't give your money to these guys who are 
taking away your entertainment. Uh, Jonas Gutenberg was the guy who invented the printing press and he was uh, responsible for uh, newspapers eventually. Uh, somewhere in this area, somewhere between here and the Bronx border, this guy was put on trial, freedom of the press. Now, uh, Mount Vernon claims it today uh, because they have the only structure that's left from 1733, but John Peter Zenga, who was part of the English colony, uh, ended up with the freedom of the press, um, ending, ending up proving freedom of the press or getting freedom of the press in an English colony. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, that's me. I'm 23 years old, and I'm interviewing presidential candidate Jack Kemp. Spark Hill, New York, May of 1979. That's a bittersweet picture in a way, because uh, here I am, I'm 23, working for a local radio station, WGRC, doing some work also for WNEW Radio, and I bet you you remember Make Believe Ballroom, right? William B. Williams, and if you're old enough, Martin Block. 23-year-old uh, me would never get that opportunity to speak to a presidential candidate anymore. Why? Because there aren't that many radio stations doing news. In fact, WVOX down the block here uh, in New Rochelle, basically uh, his, the estate of William O'Shaughnessy has sold off the frequency, 14, uh, rather 1460, and they're not doing any local news anymore. But uh, anyway, uh, that 23-year-old would never have that opportunity to do an interview with a presidential candidate. But there is censorship on radio, and it's rather simple. It's talk shows. You call a talk show, you have to... Uh, Talk to a screener who uh, tells you uh, what you can talk about or what you can't talk about to the host because the host doesn't know everything, even though the host is supposed to know all. Just screams and yells. Uh, oh, also, um, voice actors are hired through a company called Premier in Los Angeles once every 60 days. Uh, you can get hired to call a talk show and either get screamed at or scream at uh, the host or just have a normal conversation, or just say something so stupid that they drop the call and they go into commercial. That is radio censorship. And TV, I was on the Sam Donaldson show, that's Jeff Morrell, uh, who ended up being a Pentagon spokesman and then uh, worked for Disney, and that's the Sam Donaldson Politics Now show. Banned books, it's in the news a lot. And uh, this in New York is banned book week at the New York Public Library. And uh, about a year ago, a little more than a year ago, I got a call from Naperville, Illinois, the uh, library in Naperville. And banned book week, or banned book month, started at the end of September. This is about a year ago. And they said, can you do this censorship talk for us September 24th, 2023? I said, in sure it's 23? Because we're in July 2022. No, we want to book you 14 months in advance so you can talk about banned books. And that picture is from my Barnes & Noble in Florida. And uh, some of the banned books there include Joseph Heller's Catch-22, some Toni Morrison books, uh, E.B. White, Charlotte Webb, uh, uh, the Fahrenheit book is there, among others. Freedom of the Press as an English colony, and uh, it is 1733. And John Peter Zenger is a German printer. He's a journalist in New York. Uh, in 1734, he's accused of libel by Bill Cosby. Not the Bill Cosby that <laughs> you know, although he too has gotten into legal trouble. Uh, Bill Cosby was, or William Cosby, was the royal governor of New York, but the jury acquitted uh, John Peter Zenger, and that is the uh, birth of freedom of the press, but not in the United States. It's the birth of freedom of the press in an English colony called New York. And uh, that's uh, St. Uh, Peter's and Paul Church that is down in Mount Vernon near the uh, Bronx uh, border. They claim, well, they kind of claim that uh, the trial for John Peter Zenger took place in that building, but it didn't. That's the only structure that's still around in this part of the world from 1733, 1734. 1733, Zenger voiced opinions critical of the colonial governor, William Cosby. On November 17, 1734, on Cosby's orders, the sheriff arrested Zenger after a grand jury refused to indict him. The attorney general 
Richard Bradley charged him with libel in August 1735. Uh, Zegger's lawyers were Andrew Hamilton and William Smith Sr. And they successfully argued that the truth is a defense against charges of libel in an English colony. Uh, that's me. I'm at the age of 15. Uh, we were at Spring Valley High School, the New York Giants football team, play the fundraiser in basketball against uh, the teachers from Spring Valley High School. And uh, there I am doing an interview, and it's in the yearbook. Um, you know, I guess they thought, well, hey, let's put this in there because we know years from now he's going to be doing this. But I was doing that in high school, doing an interview. That's Bob Highland, used to uh, own the single wing up in uh, uh, White Plains, the bar. Uh, freedom of the press in the U.S. First Amendment, Congress shall not make no or shall make no law respecting the establishment of a religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of people peacefully to assemble and petition the government by, for a redress of grievances. Well, newspapers pretty much, they were okay. There was no such thing as radio until about 1901. Uh, so it's in 1901 where you have radio. Uh, television doesn't come about until 1939, although commercial TV, that was when commercial TV started, although there, were, there was TV in 1928. 1922, the silent film comic Fatty Arbuckle is charged with manslaughter in the death of an actress. Uh, a bisexual director found murdered, movie stars dying of uh, drug overdoses. Hollywood has a major problem, and the film industry knows it. Studio bosses say, we got to clean up our image. we got to clean up our image before people stop going to watch movies. So who do they find to clean up their image? The most corrupt guy they can find, Will Hayes, guy who ran Warren G. Harding's presidential campaign in 1920. But he was smart enough to make sure that... Uh, Harding never said anything and just stayed in his front porch, let people come to him, and um, this way he made sure that Harding wouldn't say anything off the top of his head, which might have been stupid. By the way, Harding was a newspaper guy. Hayes was a politically active lawyer, became the chairman of the Republican National Committee in 1918. He was Harding's campaign manager. He's very successful in getting Harding to run a fort, uh, front porch campaign for the presidency in 1920. Harding would beat Cox in the 1920 election. But uh, he was engulfed in all kinds of scandals. Probably the biggest one is the Teapot Dome scandal. Uh, that's the trial in 1926. Harding is long dead at this point, three years. Um, Hayes and the Teapot Dome scandal. The oil man. Harry Ford Sinclair devised a scheme in which 25 cents was diverted from the sale of every barrel of oil sold from the oil field leases, uh, that was out in the Tetons around there in Wyoming, that were the focus of the Teapot Dome scandal. Sinclair loaned Willie Hayes, or Will Hayes, uh, then the chairman of the Republican National Committee, $180,000, worth of Liberty Bonds. He got back 100000 Sinclair also gave Hayes 75000 as an outright gift to the committee. And you must be familiar with Sinclair Gas, two seventy nine dollars a gallon. That's in Montana on the way to uh, Glacier National Park um, off of uh, Route 80 up in Montana. two seventy nine dollars a gallon, Sinclair right there. Uh, at the time, Hayes is trying to pay off the debt of the 1920 Republican campaign. Hayes would uh, approach a number of wealthy men and told them if they would contribute to pay down the committee's debt, he would reimburse them for their contribution with Liberty Bonds. Hayes would testify before Congress and somehow kind of hid some facts, but even though he hid, I'm not going to say lie, just kind of hid some facts, uh, he would eventually go, to, he would not go to jail. He'd be unscathed by the ordeal. Meanwhile, Sinclair would go through the judicial system, ended up in jail, contempt of court. Hayes would go on to cleaning up the movie industry. Censorship and the movies has a very long history. Charlie Chaplin. And by the way, 
People didn't talk in movies until 1927, the jazz singer, and even that, there's hardly any uh, audio in there. So this is kind of an intro, at least to me, it's kind of interesting. Mutual Chaplin Specials, Charlie Chaplin at his best. 1913, Ohio passed a law uh, forming a board of censors, which had the duty of reviewing and approving all films intended to be exhibited in the state. The board could order the arrest of anyone, anyone, showing an unapproved film in the state. Mutual Film Corporation, a movie distributor, sought an injunction against the board. Mutual argued that in addition to the violation of its freedom of speech, the censorship board was interfering with interstate commerce in violation of the dormant commerce clause, and that the government had illegally delegated legislative authority to a censor board. Arguments were dismissed by a lower court. That is the uh, logo of Mutual back in the day. But the Supreme Court decided unanimously in 1915 in the Mutual Free uh, Film Corporation versus Industrial Commission of Ohio that free speech did not extend to motion pictures. Not about it because nobody spoke in motion pictures at the time. <laughs> did that, but that's about it. Anyway, New York became the first state to take advantage of the Supreme Court decision by instituting, instituting a censorship board, 1921. Virginia would follow suit, 1922, and the ruling would have an impact on the film industry. Well, the film industry is not necessarily worried about this type of censorship. They have other problems. They have image problems. Will Hayes resigned uh, his cabinet position as the United States Postmaster General. On January 14, 1922, he becomes the chairman of the Motion Picture Producers and Distributors of America shortly after that organization's founding. And his biggest problem is this. It's Fatty Arbuckle. People familiar with Fatty Arbuckle in here? Okay, if you're not, he was the biggest box office star in 1920 and 21. Um, he was huge. He was absolutely huge. Uh, bigger than Jolson um, at the time. And Jolson was a big Broadway star, but he was huge uh, on the screen. Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle was accused of the rape and murder of the model and actress Virginia Rapp. Uh, there were calls by religious groups uh, for federal censorship of the movies. Uh, religious groups come back a lot uh, in this talk. Um, it was a public relations ploy. Much was made of Hayes' uh, conservative credentials, which included his roles as a Presbyterian deacon and the past chairman of the Republican Party. But it's all a veneer because Hayes has no power and the studios have no power. Anybody can do whatever they want. There were no other than freedom of speech, nothing. Uh, they were denied freedom of speech, but there's nothing stopping a movie studio from doing anything they want. Less than a week after his arrest in 1921, Arbuckle's films were pulled from every screen in America. Arbuckle was accused of having caused Rapp's death, tried three times, he was acquitted three times. But his career is ruined. Hayes to the rescue, and uh, if you look rather closely, uh, it says, in a sea of real trouble, R-E-E-L, uh, the movie uh, the studios, Save Me, Save Me, and uh, written on, uh, in the cartoon, in the film, or things about, uh, you know, adultery and all this other stuff. And he's supposed to go in, and he's going to clean up. He's the new sheriff in town. He's cleaning up the movies. But his main role was business. It wasn't necessarily what's going on off screen. Uh, his main role was to persuade individual state censor boards not to ban films outright uh, and to reduce the financial uh, impact of boards cuts and edits. Studios were required by state law to pay the censor boards for each film or each foot of film cut out in each title card that was edited. You know, the title cards, bravo! And he looked that way. Well, they had to put in new title cards. Maybe not for that. Studios had to pay for the expense of duplicating and distributing separate versions of each separate film. 
uh, for the state or states that adhere to a particular board's decisions, and that could be very costly if you think of it. Hayes also would initiate a moral blacklist in Hollywood and inserted moral clauses in actors' contracts. He would have been better off just paying off newspapers, but he didn't. Uh, keep quiet, you know. You do it in politics. We don't know the private lives of these people, and you were in politics, uh, but he did it. 1930, he was one of the authors of The Code, The Hayes Code, or The Production Code, a detailed enumeration of what was morally acceptable on the screen. Uh, do you see anything wrong with uh, that picture of Claudette Colbert? Yes, she, no. She doesn't have a chest. <laughs> yeah, well, cleavage. Uh, cleavage. She has cleavage oh. out. But, I mean, I you know, know, if she was at a beach and wore that, would anybody object? On the beach? No. But that was objectionable. Will Hayes came up with his list of 36 self-imposed don'ts and be careful. It was informally known as the Hayes Code or the Code or the Production Code. According to Hayes, the Code sets up high standards of performance for motion picture producers. Hayes proclaimed when the new Code was unveiled. It states the considerations which good taste and community value make necessary in this universal form of entertainment. Here's the question. Uh, who's good taste? Your good taste might be different than my good taste, which might be different than Will Hayes' good taste. Who's good taste? Right? And who's imposing these values on you? How come you can impose your values, but I can't impose my values if my values are different? Uh, but anyway, so starts the debate. Uh, producers could not mock religion. The depiction of illegal drug use was prohibited. Interracial romance, bad. Uh, interracial marriage, banned in 17 states during Hayes' time. When the I Love Lucy show came on in 1950, it was banned in 17 states. Lucy wanted Desi as her on-screen husband on TV, her real-life husband, both CBS and uh, General Foods, uh, the potential sponsor of the I Love Lopez show, that's what it was going to be called, uh, said, uh, no, no, we, we don't want Desi Arnaz, you're doing the radio show. Uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, Use your radio people over on TV. Uh, but Lucy uh, stuck to her guns, and eventually they said Desi can be her husband. After all, he's Cuban, interracial marriage. 17 states back in those days. It was illegal. Uh, revenge plots, that was 1950. Revenge plots and the showing of crime methods, clearly enough that uh, it might be imitated, were on the don'ts list. So was she. She was on the don'ts list. It's a cartoon character. A cartoon character. Betty Boop, 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 Be Doo. A flapper. That's what flappers dressed like in the 1920s. Flappers, new breed of women, they were entrepreneurs, they had their own money, they danced to Charleston, and they went to speakeasies, and they wore clothes like that. Well, Betty Boo, no, she can't do it, Will Hayes doesn't like it. The production code was voluntary for film companies, but was mandatory for filmmakers if they wanted their films to play in American theaters. Betty Boo, cartoon flapper in the 1920s, was redesigned and wore long skirts. It was a cartoon character, a jury. Oh, Claudette Colbert is back. She's dressed properly now. Uh, you can see her hands, you can see her face, maybe a little of her neck, but you can't see anything else. She's covered. Will Hayes wins. Uh, Hayes is done by 1934, and another guy, Joseph Breen, becomes the production code administrator in 1934, and he really imposes the code, and he makes sure the studios uh, basically adhere to it. Uh, the Marx Brothers, there are pre-code movies and post-code movies, and if you watch the Mar Marx Brothers, you could see the pre-code, and then you could see the post-code. Uh, TMC, in the morning, when they do the uh, 1920s and 30 movies, you can easily see the difference between the pre-code movies and the post-code movies. Uh, which you, it seems like those postcode movies are censored. Uh, Brain was a journalist turned censor, and he's telling you 
what is morally acceptable to you, even though you might not agree with him. And he, there is uh, Joseph Breen, and he comes up with a series of don'ts. Sex and relationships, overt portrayals, and references to sexual behavior could not be shown. Adultery as a subject was to be avoided. Complete nudity never permitted. 1914, Annette Kellerman, who was an Australian swimmer, became the first person to appear nude in the movies in 1914. Uh, interracial relationships not allowed. Sex, hygiene, and venereal disease not appropriate subjects. Scenes of childbirth never to be shown. Homosexuality never to be depicted. Scenes of passion should only appear when necessary and should not be explicit. Crimes. Uh, crime and immorality can never be portrayed in a positive light. Criminals should not be made to be heroes. Methods of communicating crime could not be explicitly presented. Illegal drug usage could not be presented. Religion. Ridicule of the clergy not allowed. Religion could never be depicted in a mocking manner. Words like God, Lord, Jesus, Christ, hell, and dead could not be used unless it was in conjunction with religious ceremonies. The code did not uh, apply to Broadway stage productions. Screenwriters could write plays about subjects that were seen too controversial for Hollywood. The code also meant many non-white actors could not appear in films. Part of it is the interracial uh, uh, relationships. Now, uh, Howard Hughes is very upset, head of RKO Studios, and they put out a movie that year. It is called The Outlaw. Uh, in person, Jane Russell, um, the uh, most uh, talented newcomer on the screen, or something like that, on the bottom. Now, well, let's see what it says there. Uh, 1940s, 1943's most exciting new screen star. But, what do you notice about her? What do you notice about her? She's exposed. She's exposed. Cleavage is hanging out. Howard Hughes designed a bra for her, push-up bra, to be in that movie. And basically, it starred Jane Mansfield's cleavage, uh, rather, Jane Russell's cleavage, although later on, movies would star Jane Mansfield's cleavage as well. Um, anyway, so Howard Hughes is having a tough time getting this uh, into movie theaters, and he throws a fit when his Western The Outlaw was kept out of the theaters. And why was it kept out? Because there was too much attention on Jane Russell's cleavage. Now this guy, Billy Wilkerson, is not working hand in hand with Breen, but he might as well be working hand in hand with Breen because he is the guy that brings the Red Scare to life. It's 1946, World War II is over. And um, they're in the United States. Nobody likes Stalin or the Soviets slash Russians. Don't trust them. They're communists. Uh, July 1946, Billy Wilkerson and the Hollywood Reporter, uh, he's the owner, editor, and publisher, start to expose communists working in Hollywood. He would name the alleged Reds in his Trade Views column and expose this lurking menace. On July 29th, Wilkerson published a Trades View column that included the names of Dalton Trumbo, Howard Koch, and nine other Hollywood players the editor branded as communist sympathizers. He ruined lives. Without Wilkerson, there is that possibility that the Wisconsin Senator, Joseph McCarthy, might not have had the ability to begin his four-year reign of office, often baseless accusation which began in February 1950 in Wheeling, West Virginia, abetted by very friendly newspaper people. This is an obscure backbencher from Wisconsin. Very obscure, and all of a sudden, the newspapers have built him up. He's yelling there are 200 or 250 communist State Department. He's certain of that, but he never produced one card-carrying one card -carrying communist who was a member of the State Department. Walt Disney. He started hunting for communists in 1941. Uh, Disney branded some former animators communists, said the Screen Actors Guild was a communist front, and labeled the 1941 strike that hit his studio as a communist plot. He even contacted the FBI about alleged communist infiltration. 
Mr. Reagan, and by the way, when I was 23 years old, I interviewed him up in Bear Mountain while he was running for president. It was me, him, and about seven other people. That was it on a very cold day in January before he took off. Uh, and that was on, that was a WNEW assignment. I said, I'm 23, you want me to interview him? Yes, and I did. Uh, and I still have the audio at home from the interview I did with Ronald Reagan back then. Anyway, he goes to Washington in 1947. It's October 20th, and members of the House on Un-American Activities Committee begin an investigation into alleged communist influences in the film industry. Lauren Bacall, Humphrey Bogart. Oh, I'm going to let you in a little secret about me and Humphrey Bogart. I was friends with his mistress, Farida Thompson, who kept company with Humphrey during his marriage to Lauren Bacall. Farida Thompson, interesting character. Uh, he used to call her Pete. Her name was Farida Peterson. And uh, they would drink each other into a, a, with each other into oblivion on his boat in Newport Beach. That's another story for another day. So anyway, Humphrey Bogart, Gene Kelly, who uh, sent money to the Irish Republican Army years later so they could buy weaponry, and John Huston. They all signed a petition denouncing the committee as un-American itself for probing the politics of individual citizens. Ronald Reagan was the president of the Screen Actors Guild, and he testified that a small clique of communists have attempted to be a disruptive influence within the Screen Actors Guild. These are the Hollywood Ten, there were 11 originally, one of them turned against the others and became the Hollywood Ten. Uh, these are the guys that Wilkerson outed. Uh, ten screenwriters, 1947. Um, ten screenwriters and directors refused to testify, arguing that the First Amendment of the United States Constitution guaranteed the freedom to belong to any political organization they chose. Congress didn't see it that way, and a month later, uh, the men were cited for contempt and ultimately sentenced to a year in prison, and they would all serve some prison time eventually. The ten were Alev Bessie, Bessie uh, Herbert Bieberman, Lester Cole, Edward Dimitri, Ring Lardner Jr., I know two of his sons, uh, Rex Lardner is now retired former TV executive, and Michael Lardner, TV executive, John Howard Lawson, Albert Maltz, Samuel Ornis, Adrian Scott, Dalton Trumbo. Now I'm going to go over here, I'm going to read this to you. This is from Red Channels. Now Red Channels was a pamphlet that uh, outed communists, or supposed communists. And I'm going to read this to you, and I assume everybody here is a child of the 1950s, right? And you got to watch TV in the 1950s, so we got that clear. Americans don't patronize Reds! You can drive the Reds out of television, radio, and Hollywood. This track will tell you how. Why we must drive them out. The Reds have made our screen, radio, and TV Moscow's most effective fifth column in America. The Reds of Hollywood and Broadway have always been the chief financial support of communist propaganda in America. Our own films, made by Red producers, directors, writers, and stars, are being used by Moscow in Asia. Africa and the Balkans and throughout Europe to create a hatred of America. Right now, films are being made to craftily glorify Marxism. I'm going to take offense to that because weren't, wasn't Marxism glorified in the 1930s by uh, Chico, Harpo, Groucho, and Zeppo? I mean, uh, Duck Soup and, and all of that. My favorite movie, Duck Soup, of that group. Uh, but I think they're talking about Karl Marx. What do you think? Karl Marx and Frederick Engel. UNESCO and One Worldism and V, your TV set, they're being piped into your living room and they're poisoning the mind of your children under your very eyes. How many of you were poisoned like me? <laughs> That's poison. That's poison. So remember, if you patronize a film made by red producers, writers, stars, and studios, you are eating and abetting communism. Every time you permit Reds to come into your living room via your TV set, you are helping Moscow and the internationalists to destroy America. That's what's going on, 1950s, 53, 54, 55. What's going on? The Red Scare, the blacklist involved the practice of denying employment to entertainment industry uh, professionals believed to be or have been communists or sympathizers. 
not just actors, but screenwriters, directors, musicians like Leonard Bernstein. You know, Leonard Bernstein was blackballed? Leonard Bernstein. Um, and other American entertainment professionals were barred from work by the studios. I pr you probably don't know who this is. Uh, anybody watch The Honeymooners back in the day? That's the original Alice Cramden. Her name was Pert Kelton. Uh, in 1951, uh, she was on The Honeymooners, comedy sketches on the Dumont Television Network, uh, a ca a Network's Cavalcade of Stars. Uh, she was abruptly dropped from her role after being blacklisted, replaced by Audrey Meadows. Rather than acknowledge she was blacklisted, Jackie Gleason and the show's producers explained that her departure was based on alleged heart problems. She came back to Gleason in the mid-1960s when he did the show out of Miami Beach and did the uh, honeymoon sketches, and she was Alice Cramden's mother in that. Many of you remember or know of Hazel Scott? You know of Hazel Scott? Great pianist. Absolutely great pianist. In 2019, Alicia Keys, when she won a Grammy, you know who Alicia Keys is? Yeah. yeah. When she won a Grammy, special shout out to Hazel Scott. I always dreamed of playing two pianos at once. She was a great, great pianist. Uh, she was an actress. Uh, on July 3rd, 1950, the jazz pianist and singer Hazel Scott became the first African Caribbean. She was born in Trinidad and Tobago, African-American, she grew up in Harlem, or a person of color to host a national American television show. It was on the Dumont Network. The show came to an abrupt end on September 29, 1950. She was named in uh, Red Channels, uh, the pamphlet that listed supposed communist sympathizers, of which she wasn't. They tried to nail her because she played the piano at the Cafe Society in 1939 in Greenwich Village but she was not a communist sympathizer, but they nailed her for that. And also she wanted some rights while she was working in Hollywood in the 1940s um, and, and all. Uh, so uh, she's named on, January, on June 22nd. Despite her husband, Congressman Adam Clayton, the pal, the second's uh, objections, she chose to uh, testify before the House on American Activities Committee to defend herself on September 22nd. Sponsors in Dumont dropped the show within days. Sad story here, Philip Loeb. Uh, Philip Loeb, in 1955, checked himself into the Taft Hotel in Midtown Manhattan under a false name, took a fatal dose of sleeping pills. Loeb was accused of being a communist and could no longer find work. Six years earlier, he was the co-star of one of TV's first situation comedies, The Goldbergs, created by Gertrude Berg, who was blacklisted too because she was friends with Lowe. She was blacklisted. Oh, Lucy the Red, uh, the mirror, that's probably out in San Francisco, judging from the back page of that. Uh, Seven Cents, Lucy Ball and Red Lake. How many of you know about Lucy the Communist? Anybody? It was in the movie. That was yeah. HBO. Yeah, Luce, yeah, the, the, uh, one of the two movies made last year. It's September 4th, 1953. That was the movie done by Aaron Sokin, who comes from Scarsdale. Uh, September 4th, 1953, Lucille Ball gave a voluntary testimony to an investigator for the House and Un-American Activities Committee. It was our grandfather, Fred Hunt. He just wanted us to. And uh, we just did something to please him didn't intend to vote that way. As I recall, I didn't. Uh, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover was a big fan of I Love Lucy. That might have saved Lucy from being blacklisted. That and the amounts of money, scads of money that were coming in to Desi Lu and to uh, CBS and Philip Morris. Money talks. Nobody walks, right? Money talks. Uh, Lucy uh, swore to the House Committee that she had never knowingly aided the Communist Party aside from placating her grandfather's many requests for room in the garage to organize with friends, they had her dead to rights. That's her certificate of registration, voting, 1936. Uh, her address and everything is up there. And uh, number nine, where it says, uh, I intend, uh, well, let me go up there because it's too uh, small for me over there on the computer. I intend to affiliate at the ensuing primary election with the Communist Party. They had her dead to rights, absolutely dead to rights. Uh, in her autobiography, Lucille observed in herself a strong conservative, pure and straight. 
proclaimed, I'm the most conservative member of my family. It's for her grandfather, Fred Hunt, a progressive and free thinker she registered as a communist. Well, she has to explain going before, or as uh, Desi would say, we'll see, explain, uh, she explained to the media about uh, her testimony. And uh, very quickly, I'm going to tell you the story of Desi. He comes over to the United States in 1933. His family in Cuba was, was politically correct, uh, collected, politically connected. His father was a politician, the rum company. Uh, they had a stake in the rum company, and they're thrown out because they're on the other side of the sergeant's revolt in 1933. Batista, the dictator in the 50s, comes to power for the first time. They escape to Miami Beach with literally the shirts on their back, and that was 1933. This is 20 years later, and I can't help but think that Desi is probably thinking, I can't go through this again. And yet, here he is. This could ruin his career and Lucy's career. Uh, before the filming of episode 68 of I Love Lucy, entitled The Girls Go Into Business, uh, Arnez addresses the accusation while doing his usual studio audience uh, warm-up. Desi thought Lucy was going to be booed off the stage. He reused the line in Heather Hopper's gossip column. The only thing read about Lucy is her hair, and even that's not legitimate. Brown. There she is, late 1930s, early 1940s. Shortly after Lucy signed with MGM uh, in the 1940s, studio hairstylist Sidney Gelleroth changed the comedian's hair from brown to red. The 1943 film, DeBerry Was a Lady, debuted her new hair to the movie audiences and earned Lucy the nickname Technicolor Tessie, which probably was not a uh, nickname of, uh, of affection, but there she is, she's not a natural redhead. The blacklist uh, disappeared by the early 1960s. Many careers were ruined. Trumbo and Lardner subsequently wrote screenplays under their own names. It would be Dalton Trumbo. His name would be attached to Spartacus when Spartacus came out because Kirk Douglas wanted his name in the credits, and he got it. Uh, other people whose careers were impacted included Frederick March, Julius Garfinkel, John Garfield. They wanted him to testify against his wife, who was once a member of the Communist Party, Roberta. Dropped dead because of this from a heart attack, age of about 38. Uh, Paul Muni, Edward G. Robinson, Helen Keller. Helen Keller was blacklisted. Helen Keller. Uh, Danny Kaye, Paul Robeson, which could be sort of understandable because he went to the Soviet Union. The writers, Dorothy Parker, a host of Hollywood actors, writers, and directors were accused of being communist, and Pete Seeger was blackballed from TV until 1968. Billy Wilkerson's son, Willie, apologized for his father using the Hollywood Reporter as a blunt instrument that ruined the lives of at least 300 people and their families. 1950, CBS employees had to take an oath of loyalty to the United States. Lucy was on CBS doing um, the uh, radio show, uh, My Favorite Husband, but she was an outside contractor. 1951, the I Love Lucy show goes on. CBS created a security uh, office staffed by former FBI agents to investigate the political leanings of their employees. Lucy was an employee. She uh, happened to uh, be an outside contractor supplying a program. Roberto Rossellini's Il Mercolo would change things, at least change things legally. 1952, the case of Joseph Burston, Inc. v. Wilson. U.S. Supreme Court overruled the 1915 decision that free speech did not apply to motion pictures. The court also ruled that the New York Board of Regents could not ban the short film, The Miracle, because it violated the First Amendment. Many of you enjoyed this movie with Bernie Schwartz and Jack Lemmon and Norma Jean Mortensen. Some like it hot. Risque or not? It's a funny movie. It is a really, really funny movie. Billy Wilder and all. Uh, directed it, um, and, and of course there's Bernie Schwartz who went to Seward High School on the Lower East Side. He's a little older than my mother. My mother went to Seward High School on the Lower East Side, and uh, by the time she got there, he was forgotten. <laughs> he was Tony Curtis by then. 
Uh, some like it hot. Risque movie or not? Film was condemned by the National League of Decency. Well, who are they to say we're the National League of Decency? Would you be of the same mind of decency like them? I don't know. Catholic organization that uh, acted as a uh, watchdog for corruptive content on the grounds it was morally objectable and promoted homosexuality, lesbians, and transvestism. It was banned in Kansas after United Artists refused to edit the love scene between Tony Curtis and Marilyn Monroe, while in Memphis, the censorship board restricted viewing to adults only. Uh, the Hayes Code is pretty much gone, or the code, or, or the production code by 1968, uh, as um, the Motion Picture Association of America has a new uh, film rating system. Uh, there were four tiers, G for general audiences, all ages. And for mature adults or audiences, those over the age of 12, although I know people in their 30s that you would never consider mature. Uh, R for restricted, children under 16 must be accompanied by an adult. And I only heard of this, I don't know this firsthand, it's hearsay, but in Spring Valley, uh, if you had fake ID, you could get into X rated movies. All you had to do is show, I, like I said, it wasn't me, but I heard of it. Uh, X-rated for extremely graphic, people 18 or over would be admitted. Now, speaking of Spring Valley, and speaking of Rockland County, 1973, still doing work at the, uh, the Nyack Journal News, uh, basically, uh, 17 years old. Um, and I used to work at WRKL, uh, and they used to have a talk show, 12 o'clock, called Hotline, where there was no screener, you just picked up the phone and some guy could scream at you or whatever. Uh, Ramapo is adjacent to Clarkstown. I lived in Ramapo. Clarkstown was right over the border. The radio station was in Ramapo. Uh, yeah, in Ramapo, Mount Ivy. But you go a little bit to the east, there's Havistor and there's Clarkstown. So Clarkstown's a town up there. Uh, in 1973, U.S. Supreme Court said that community standards must be taken into account in determining whether or not something was obscene. In the town of Clarkstown, New York, hotline, this guy, Marty Snyder, used to call all the time. Marty Snyder was blind, lost his sight at the age of 55, was a businessman at one point, but he used to call and yammer away and yammer away and yammer away. Clarkstown, local officials established a nine-member obscenity committee to screen movies, cabaret acts, and printing matter. The town selected Marty Snyder, who was blind, 60-year-old retiree who was once a restaurateur, once a businessman, to head the committee. He once said, I know porn when I see it. <laughs> he couldn't see. Now, I covered news in Rockland County later on, and I covered the town of Clarkstown occasionally. George Gerber was the... Uh, town supervisor, and he once said to me, that kid has a lot of potential, but gets his facts wrong sometimes. And I said to, uh, I said, hey, George, tell me what I got wrong. George went through the other room, never spoke to me. Anyway, uh, the obscenity committee, I think they set this up to fail uh, by putting Marty Snyder up there, just say, this is ridiculous. Uh, the committee would fade into oblivion. How many of you have read Lady Chatty's Lover, or La Lady Chatterley's Lover? What do you think of the book? Is that the British novel yeah, yeah. about having different lovers? And yeah. Her husband didn't get along with her. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, yeah. I read the whole book. Some of us just read specific. <laughs> Some of you were assigned the book in high school, like this woman uh, I knew in the early 1960s who went to uh, uh, New Canaan High School. Anyway, Lady Chatterley's Lover, D. H. Lawrence. Uh, the Postmaster General, Arthur Summerfield, banned D.H. Lawrence's famous novel, Lady Chatterley's Lover, from U.S. Mails. Uh, I got a bone to pick with uh, Summerfield about something else. And this shows you the mentality. How many of you enjoy getting Saturday mail? Mail on Saturday, or used to before email and instant messaging and all that, right? This guy in 1957 decided he's going to save money. And... He ended Saturday mail service, 1957. Uh, by Monday, it was restored by Dwight Eisenhower, who really didn't appreciate the fact 
And people were very upset that they didn't get their mail, mail on Saturday. Uh, anyway, uh, so uh, first published private edition, 1928, in Florence, Italy. The novel was censored in the U.S. and the U.K. for 30 years because of sexual content. A federal district court in New York on July 21, 1959, declared Lady Chatterley's Lover uh, not obscene and opened the way for its publication and distribution. Banned in Boston. You don't hear that phrase anymore. Banned in Boston. Uh, that uh, is a book that was written by Neil Miller about the Watch and Ward Society crusade against books, burlesque, and social evil. They decided what social evil was. You did. They did. Uh, Banned in Boston was a phrase employed from the late 19th century through the mid-20th century to describe a literary work, song, motion picture, or play that had been prohibited from distribution or exhibition in Boston, Massachusetts. Boston officials had wide authority to ban works featuring objectionable content and often ban works with sexual content or foul language. Uh, there is their logo, New England Watch and Ward Society, Boston, with a snake in there. Uh, the Watch and Ward Society, or the New England Society for the Suppression of Vice, uh, devoted itself to shutting down gambling operations, burlesque calls, and brothels. They were most famous, however, for their uh, censorship of books, because they felt it was more important to ban books than shutting down gambling operations. Uh, or magazines, plays giving uh, birth to the uh, phrase, banned in Boston. Hemingway couldn't sell books in Boston. Nor could Faulkner, nor could uh, Huxley, or Sinclair Lewis, Eugene O'Neill, Upton Sinclair, Voltaire, Walt Whitman, H.G. Wells, War of the Worlds. He didn't. He wrote the book in 1898, but it was Orson Welles that made it famous again 40 years later in that radio broadcast, which led to Orson Welles being able and having the wherewithal to write Citizen Kane and become Orson Welles. Book banning 2022-23. In uh, June 2023, the Davis School District in Utah removed the Bible from elementary and middle schools for containing vulgarity and violence. Uh, there was a complaint from a parent that the King James Bible has material unsuitable for children. Utah's Republican government passed a law banning pornographic or indecent books from schools. And here is the king of book banning, the Florida governor, Ron DeSantis, who, by the way, went to both Yale and Harvard, who, by the way, is an overachiever in education and must have been a pretty good reader to get as far as he got. And yet he's now judging, or his people are now judging, what you could read. Uh, in 2022, in fact, if I was a reporter covering Ron DeSantis, I would ask him, you had every advantage in the world to get to Ivy League schools. You're not elite. You, you basically aren't legacy. You made it on your own. How would you do it? Did you read bad books? I do a journalism talk, and I'm appalled at the quality of questions that a lot of journalists, because they're lazy. They don't, they don't want to ask tough questions, nor do they want to do any research. But that's another story for another time. In uh, 2022, Florida became one of the first states to enact laws making it easier for parents to challenge books in school libraries they deem to be pornographic, uh, deal improperly with racial issues, or in other ways inappropriate for students. Activists and politicians have objected to an entire genre of books that deal with LG, uh, BTQ plus topics or issues, other targeted books deal with race. The Diary of Anne Frank was removed from the Vero Beach High School Library after a parent group called Mothers for Liberty. Again, you know, these are people who say this is who they are and don't worry about what you think because they're right. Uh, complain that the book minimizes the Holocaust and shows the young girl's thoughts about other female bodies. The book is compulsory reading in Germany, but not in Vero Beach, Florida, or parts of Texas. Book banning, Pan America, the freedom to write. The American Library Association reported in 2022 there was 
1,269 demands to restrict or ban books and other materials in schools and libraries, and that was up from 156 demands in 2020. It's all because of political culture uh, wars designed to win some votes for some politicians. According to Penn America, Jacksonville, Florida, Duval County, uh, Florida officials admitted the biographies of the baseball players Hank Aaron and Roberto Clemente, along with 177 other books, were removed from school classrooms and school library bookshelves. By September 2023, school districts in Florida initiated 1,406 book bans, followed by Texas 625, Missouri 333, Utah 281, including the Bible, and Pennsylvania 186. Now I get to television and we're in the home stretch here, so bear with me for a few minutes uh, because you've heard of all these people for the most part. Remember John Cameron Swayze? Do you remember him from news or the Timex commercials? Uh, the Timex commercials were, you know, they did something to the watch. It took a licking, but it's still ticking. Timex. John Cameron Swayze, first anchor on TV, censorship. The makers of Camel Cigarettes bring you the world's latest news events right into your living room. Sit back, light up a camel, and be an eyewitness to the happenings that made history in the last 24 hours. The Camel News Caravan. Uh, R.J. Reynolds handed over its news production over to NBC, with the company choosing the name of the new nightly news show, Camel News Caravan, and its face, John Cameron Swayze. It began on February 16, 1949, running every night, 7.45 Eastern Time. Swayze and the Camel News Caravan pioneered a news format that is still used. But censorship almost immediately. NBC News reports, not allowed to show no smoking signs. It's R.J. Reynolds. And the only news figure permitted to be seen smoking a cigar, Winston Churchill. Oh, NBC said to R.J. Reynolds, can we cover the Korean War? For whatever reason, they said no. There was no coverage initially of the Korean War on the Camel News Caravan Show. Bill Paley founded CBS in 1928 with the radio station WCAU in Philadelphia. Uh, according to Don Horowitz, Don Hewitt, the uh, creator of 60 Minutes, Bill Paley erected two towers of power, one for entertainment, one for news. Uh, this was in Ewart's autobiography, Tell Me a Story. And he decreed that there would be no bridge between them. In short, Paley was the guy who put Frank Sinatra and Edward R. Morrow on radio in 60 minutes on television. There's Morrow. Morrow was approached to host the TV weekly program. Along with his associate, Fred Friendly, I know his wife, Ruth Friendly, 94 years old, was teaching at Columbia University journalism until... COVID-19 pandemic hit in March of 2020, and she told me a story, which I'm going to tell you in a minute. Uh, anyway, Morrow was producing a popular radio show, Hear It Now. The television show was to be called See It Now. Television was in its infancy, and Morrow and Friendly had to learn the process of filmmaking and primitive television equipment on the job. Um, that's a CBS when they uh, celebrated Morrow, which they're celebrating now, even though he left unceremoniously in 1960, uh, putting out some highlights of Edward R. Morrow. Uh, it would be Morrow who took down Joe McCarthy in 1954. Uh, a report on Joseph McCarthy, see it now, March 9, 1954. Uh, Morrow was not allowed to use CBS money to promote the show or the CBS I logo. The show used McCarthy's words against him. Uh, McCarthy wanted equal time. Got it, April 6, 1954. Probably should have regretted it because most people, the only thing they remember other than a buffoon was the smirking. Morrow took him out, totally. But Bill Paley realized how powerful TV was and how powerful Edward R. Morrow was. And he started to snip away at Morrow's power. Uh, Morrow complained to Paley, I can't keep doing the show if uh, you tell me I have to give equal time to subjects wronged by the program. It was a fairness doctrine in those days, and you had to do it. By 1960, Morrow had enough. He left. His last show was Harvest of Shame, which was done in black and white, 1960. It's up on YouTube if you want to watch it. 
you would say, hey, wait a minute, did that take place two weeks ago, other than the fact that it's in black and white? Nothing has changed. Showed the plight of the American migrant agricultural worker. Well, Morrow's next uh, project was a civil rights report, and Howard K. Smith was doing it with him. Morrow's God, and Morrow, was ta Morrow told Smith, keep doing it, just do it. And Ruth uh, Friendly told me about what I'm going to tell you now. Uh, Howard K. Smith was fired, CBS News correspondent, covering the riots in Birmingham, Alabama during the Civil Rights Revolution in the early 1960s. After giving an account of blood flowing in the streets, Smith ended his planned documentary, wasn't on yet, with a quotation from Edmund Burke. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. The network powers summoned Smith to New York. He's told that his commentary violated standards of objectivity. Whose standards? William Paley's standards? Uh, Paley said, I've heard all this junk before. If that's what you believe, you better go somewhere else. He was fired and ended up at ABC. Oh, entertainment, Lenny Bruce. And you know, Lenny Bruce, somebody's going to walk into a one o'clock uh, performance, one in the morning performance, like a nine-year-old smoking a cigarette, vodka in hand, cursing. Well, you may laugh at that, but there were two people in New York who thought that, the DA Frank Hogan and Cardinal Francis Spellman. Uh, Lenny Bruce was arrested on drug charges in Philadelphia, obscenity charges in San Francisco in late 1961, but was acquitted. 1962 drug charge in Los Angeles dropped by 1963. He's convicted of obscenity in Chicago and was arrested on stage. A mugshot from 1961. The Manhattan District Attorney Frank Hogan, working in conjunction with local church officials, including New York's Cardinal Francis Spellman, began their own investigation of Bruce. 1964, he was booked at the popular Greenwich Village nightclub, Cafe Agogo. Undercover detectives recorded two of his shows. They tell you you can't record shows. They broke the law. The cops. They broke the law. Anyway, they presented it to a grand jury to obtain an indictment. In early April 1964, Bruce is arrested, charged with violating New York's Penal Code 1140 in Greenwich Village of all places. This is not someplace in the South. This is in Greenwich Village, barring obscene material that could aid in the corruption of morals of youth and others. Faced a maximum punishment of three years in jail. Club owner was also arrested for allowing Lenny Bruce to perform the material. In November 1964, Bruce fired his attorneys, was convicted, as was the club owner, Howard Solomon. His sentence later overturned. Bruce is sentenced to four months in the workhouse. He became a free speech martyr and would influence the comics of that era, including Joan Rivers, George Carlin, who almost immediately did a skit called The Seven Dirty Words. So, uh, so much for Hogan and uh, Spellman being the uh, moral authorities. Carlin put out an album based on Lenny Bruce's speech. And Richard Carlin, uh, rather Richard Pryor, who also worked blue, didn't exactly work clean. Then there were the Smothers Brothers. And these Smothers Brothers watchers in here back in the day? So you're not going to object. None of you are going to be upset with the material. And the people who were watching the show weren't going to object. It was the people who never watched the show that objected. How does that work? Well, I asked him, William Paley. That's kind of the expression he probably had when he found out that Nelson Rockefeller and his wife Babs soiled the sheets. It's in a book. Uh, at uh, his home and had to change the mattress. Uh, it's in the book. You can look it up. It's there. Anyway, 1968-69, uh, the premiere of the CBS uh, Smothers Brothers show for the season. CBS deleted the entire segment of Harry Belafonte singing Lord Don't Stop the Carnival against the backdrop of riots at the 1968 Chicago Democratic National Convention. And they cut out uh, two lines of satire about their main competitor, Bonanza. What was the problem? Huff Singh didn't cook the soup hot enough for Haas. Oh, pa, we need a new cook. Paley and CBS not only completely cut out the number, but added insult to injury. 
by replacing it with a five-minute campaign ad from the Republican presidential nominee, ah, Richard Nixon. And some of you know that I dealt with Nixon for about five years in the mid-1980s as a reporter. Now, if you're watching the Smothers Brothers, how likely is it that you are going to vote for Dick Nixon? <laughs> Nixon's the one. It's the March 9th show, or the show that was supposed to be on March 9th, that ends the Smothers Brothers. CBS uh, broadcasts a rerun, March 9th, 1969. Placing a show which Joan Baez was talking about her husband, David Harris, who was entering jail after refusing military service, and the comedian Jackie Mason. You know, Jackie Mason should never have been on those Sunday shows at CBS. I mean, he gets fired from Ed Sullivan doing this, 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 this. Remember Jackie Mason getting fired? And now he's got a joke on the Smothers Brothers show, which came after the Sullivan show, although that was 64, this is 69, a joke about children playing doctor. Be David Steinberg, that would be the uh, impetus that pushed it off the cliff. David Steinberg grew up in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. His father was a rabbi, which meant that he sat through tons and tons and tons of sermon, sermons every Saturday. Uh, anyway, so he gave sermons on the Smothers Brothers show. There were battles uh, that continued over content, including this one. David Steinberg's sermon about Moses and the burning bush. It offended someone. Probably didn't offend you as Smothers Brothers viewers. It offended someone, like Bill Palin. That skit pushed CBS to cancel the show. And he's very happy that the show is over. Our Richard Nixon. And I got to meet Nixon accidentally through David and Julie Eisenhower through a guy by the name of Richie Phillips. Um, Baseball umpires and the owners were having a problem negotiating in 85. Um, Richie Phillips lived in Philadelphia, Society Hill, next to a neighbor, Julia David Eisenhower. He calls Peter Ubrot, the baseball commissioner, and said, we're going nowhere. How about arbitration? What do you have in mind? Dick Nixon. Dick Nixon, get out of here. How do you know? He's next door babysitting. I can ask him. Can you imagine Richard Nixon, who lived in uh, Upper Salt River, New Jersey, who used to go down every Friday night to babysit? Can you imagine him? Uh, let me make this perfectly clear. I don't like the fact that those toys are out. Uh, so let me say this about that. You better pick up the toys or you're going to detention. Richard Nixon. Nixon didn't like the Smothers Brothers, and he got help from the CBS programming chief Robert D. Wood and the TV Guide uh, publisher Walter Annenberg who uh, took hard stances against the brothers. Now here's the problem with TV back in 1969, less so today. Television and radio as a news medium depends for existence upon government license. You don't get the license, you don't get it on TV. Nixon would threaten to revoke uh, radio station or TV station licenses from owners that he viewed as the enemy. Newspapers had no restriction. Another enemy, Spiro Agnew. It's November 13th, 1969, Des Moines, Iowa, Vice President Spiro Agnew accuses network TV departments of bias and distortion. Perhaps the place to start looking for a credibility gap is not in the offices of the government in Washington, but in the studios of the networks in New York, so said the Vice President, who was accepting kickbacks at the time in the White House from Baltimore contractors, a uh, layover from his days as the Maryland governor, and by 1973, forced to resign. And that's Patrick Buchanan, Pat Buchanan, one of Nixon's speechwriters to your right, Nixon's left. He writes the anti-network network, uh, anti -network news speech, and he also writes a speech. That's William Sapphire, neighboring nabobs of negativism. Uh, the Nixon White House strategy, declare war on the American news media. A former St. Louis Post-Dispatch writer, Patrick Buchanan, William Sapphire, stoked the flames. Sapphire wrote the nadering nabobs of negativism words for Agnew, and then he went on to write a column for the New York Times after trying to destroy the news industry. He was hired by the Times. Needless to say, I'm not a big fan. Daniel Short, first guy to work for CNN. Uh, he's on Nixon's enemy list. That's the informal name of what started out as a list of the President of the United States, Richard Nixon's 
Major Political Opponents, compiled by Charles Colson, written by George T. Bell, assistant to Colson, special counsel to the White House, and sent in memorandum form to the White House counsel, John Dean, on September 9, 1971. Dean, part of the media today. It's on CNN, commenting on the travails of Donald Trump. Daniel Shore, the CBS newsman and the actor, Paul Newman, on that list. Why is Newman on the list? He marched with the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. during the Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s. In 2008, released transcripts of Richard Nixon's Oval Office tapes had Nixon talking about, ah, oh, the press is the enemy, ah, oh, the establishment's the enemy, the professors are the enemy. So is he, Abby Hoffman, the censored shirt. Merv Griffin was opposed Johnny Car opposite Johnny Carson. CBS hired him, uh, trying to knock Johnny Carson off the throne and to fill in time late nights on CBS. Merv Griffin was a rock rib Republican. He was a card carrying Republican, very proud of it. But CBS was uncomfortable with the guests that, uh, that Merv wanted because they spoke out against the Vietnam War. When the political activist Abby Hoffman was Griffin's guest in April 1970, CBS blurred the video of Hoffman, so viewers at home would not see his trademark American flag patterned shirt, even though other guests like Roy Rogers wore the same shirt in the past, uncensored. Um, uh, Merv uh, disliked the uh, censorship imposed by CBS and complained. He went back to syndication in 1972, asked me, I like, Mike Griff, um, I like Merv Griffin and Mike Douglas better than Johnny Carson, but it's just me. No longer the Tiffany Network CBS. That ended when the day they gave me my ID at CBS, right? <laughs> me? CBS? Morrow and Cronkite are distant memories. Daniel Ellsberg recently passed away. Remember Daniel Ellsberg? Pentagon Papers? Uh, government consultant gained access to some uh, classified documents about uh, American involvement in Vietnam, leaked them to the New York Times, June 1971. The documents revealed many large-scale attacks in Vietnam that the U.S. public was not aware of. General feeling was that the United States government had misled the public, withheld the truth. Anybody read that? Mm -hmm. Pentagon Papers back in the day? The Times was slapped with an injunction ordering a stop to the publication. Ellsberg provided the Pentagon Papers to the Washington Post and 15 other newspapers. The case entitled New York Times vs. the United States ultimately went to the Supreme Court. June 30, 1971, the court issued a landmark 6-3 decision authorizing the newspapers to print the Pentagon Papers without risk of government censure. For leaking the Pentagon Papers, Ellsberg was charged with theft, conspiracy, and violations of the Espionage Act. But Nixon had a gang that couldn't shoot straight. See that file cabinet? Does it look, if you could see it, it looks like somebody tampered with it, right? They did. It's Dr. Lewis Fielding's file cabinet, and he was Ellsberg's psychiatrist. Nixon, on Nixon's behalf, E. Howard Hunt drafted a proposal to neutralize Ellsberg, leading to the Dr. Fielding operation. The plumber's first task was the burglary of the office of Daniel Ellsberg's Los Angeles psychiatrist, Louis J. Fiedling in an effort to uncover evidence to discredit Ellsberg, who had leaked the Pentagon Papers, which actually did not extend into Nixon's years, only through Robert McNamara, the White House plumbers, the gang that couldn't shoot straight, E. Howard Hunt, G. Gordon Liddy, uh, James McCourt, Chuck Colson. First time I found out about the break-in, Ellsberg said, was when government prosecutors revealed it to the judge, and he told my lawyers. Nixon wanted that information withheld. But he had been warned that this could make him criminally liable. The judge cited the government misconduct, dismissed all the charges. Meanwhile, Watergate poses other problems. This is Dr. Frank Stanton, who was running CBS News at the time in 1971, and he was threatened with jail. CBS broadcast an hour-long investigative report called The Selling of the Pentagon, $30 million campaign by the Defense Department to improve its image. The House Interstate and Foreign Commerce Committee demanded that he turn over material cut from the program. He said no, called before the committee. He says, if newsmen are told their notes, films, 
and tapes will be subjected to compulsory process so that the government can determine whether the news has been satisfactorily edited, the scope, nature, and vigor of their news reporting will be inevitably curtailed. Coming down to the end, Woodward and Bernstein. And you know all about them, uh, and uh, Ben Bradley, the executive editor, and uh, Graham, Catherine Graham, the post uh, publisher. It's Graham and it's Bradley, the, who are the real heroes of uh, the Watergate uh, investigation. They could have stopped it at any time, but they let Woodward and Bernstein loose. Uh, it's June 19, 1972. Woodward and Bernstein, the Washington Post, revealed that one of the Watergate burglars, James McCord, was a Republican security aide. Watergate, when I had hair, I was 26 years old. 1972, Paley ordered the shortening of a second installment of a two-part CBS Evening News series on Watergate. After he was contacted by Charles Colson, an aide to Nixon, Paley ordered the banishment of instant analysis by his newspeople following president, the presidential addresses. Uh, Paley's reporters took umbrage with what they believed to have been censorship of their reporting in the Watergate piece, and had traditionally enjoyed the ability to sway public opinion with their instant analysis following presidential addresses. Nixon is at war with the media, particularly the Washington Post. He has the enemies list. People like Dick Cavett, he's an enemy. And guess what? He gets audited by the IRS. His surrogates mounted a campaign to yank the license of a television station owned by the Washington Post, which broke the Watergate scandal, published parts of the Pentagon Papers. And I'm going to leave you with Lowell Bergman. And if you watch uh, PBS, you know who Lowell Bergman is because he's on Frontline. Lowell Bergman, it's CBS again. 1980s, Lowell Bergman became a producer for CBS 60 Minutes. But well, there was a story about Big Tobacco, later adapted for a film that made Bergman a star in his own right. 1993, Bergman received a box on his doorstep in Berkeley, California. Sent anonymously, it contained internal documents from the tobacco company, Philip Morris. For help with analyzing the material, Bergman contacted Jeffrey Wygant, former head of research for the tobacco company, Brown & Williams. Sent, Brown & Williams. B&W fired Wigand, had him sign a confidentiality uh, agreement. While that meant that Wigand couldn't talk to Bergman about his issues with B&W, 60 Minutes used him as a paid consultant for an investigative story about fire-safe cigarettes. Wigand eventually agreed to be an executive or to an exclusive interview with Bergman in 1995. There he is. CBS's lawyers were hesitant about airing the story. Just a year before, seven tobacco CEOs testified before Congress about the possible side effects of their company's product. All seven said on their oath that they believed nicotine was not addictive. Months later, the Justice Department opened a criminal investigation of the CEOs, charging they had committed perjury. Nothing came of it. One of those CEOs, Andrew Tisch, the son of the CBS chairman, Lawrence Tisch. Surprise, surprise. As Gomer Pyle once said, CBS and Westinghouse were in merger talks. If the $5.4 billion deal went through, top executives at CBS were going to make millions. The news outlet didn't want to stop the tobacco, did want, didn't want to air the tobacco report for personal reasons. Bergman said, because they were worried by a tobacco company uh, lawsuit, which could jeopardize the merger. At one point, Bergman said, a CBS executive told him, the corporation will not risk its assets on this story, period. In late 1995, CBS decided to air a sanitized version of the story, but without Wigand's interview. Soon articles uh, started to appear in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal. Wonder who planted those? Oh, hi, Lo. Uh, and he made the calls. The damage was done. CBS's credibility was in question. Bergman quit. The Wigand interview would be seen in 1996, but CBS was added. The movie, The Insider. Uh, Bergman's investigation of the tobacco industry and the subsequent breakup with 60 Minutes were the basis of the 1999 film, The Insider, starring Al Pacino as Bergman and Russell Crowe as Wigand. It was nominated for seven Academy Awards. Mike Wallace, actor. I think he went to the Lee Strasberg School of Acting. 
quiz show moderator, cigarette spokesman, rehabilitated by CBS to become a news person. Bergman said his uh, relationship with Mike Wallace and Don Ewart never recovered. Two bosses sided with CBS over the Wygant interview. At the journalism conference in 2000, Ewart denounced Bergman said, saying that he shouldn't be allowed with one, within 100 miles of a newsroom. A year later, he called Bergman. He wanted to catch up. Bergman said, I'm busy. Hung up. They never spoke again. Bergman resurfaced on PBS's Frontline show. And we're going to have to leave it at that. Censorship continues to this day. Books are banned in certain states and schools and libraries. Adaptation of Anne Frank's diary has been banned in school districts in Florida and in Texas. Sometimes it's because of politics. Sometimes because of business concerns. Most of the time, it's not about national security. Thank you so much. Any questions, any comments? Thank you. Thank you. It's all yours. Yeah. Thank you.